intended message. My guest today is Joni Petty. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Joni. One, she is the co-author of the book, The Fab Quotient, Experience, Resilience, and Fight Fatigue. Uh, sounds like a good read uh, at this, during this, these times. Uh, she's also, two, number two, she's co-author of Resilience Up Assessment, which is launched in 200 countries. So got a lot of readers there. And three, she is a roadrunner. Yes, she's run five, five, ultra marathons which means a lot more than a marathon they're called a comrades and each comrade is 90 kilometers or 56 miles and that's almost twice what a normal if it, marathon is if you could call any kind of marathon normal <laughs> and, and a, a run a run a, a run a normal marathon and i can tell you that running that ultra marathon uh, Joni, must have been a lot of pain it was a lot of pain and a lot of grit, George. Uh, yes, it's madness. And um, I'm glad I'm over that madness and I've matured and I've wisened up. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, because I, I imagine that one of the things in running a marathon, you've got plenty of time to talk to yourself. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, the inner dialogue is important because uh, when you're on uh, – the 50th kilometer or the 30th mile, uh, there's a lot of negative dialogue happening and you want to give up. So uh, internal self-talk is very important to be able to flip it on its head and say, you can do it. You've got grit. You'll get to the end. And you've got blisters on your toes and your, you know, your toes are bleeding and you're not feeling so good. Yeah. And I, I can, yeah, I can just hear the voice in your, in your head going, you're not going to make it. You look <laughs> terrible. Everyone looks better than you. That's right. That's right. Indeed. And, and, and then the funny thing is when you cross that finish line, all of a sudden the conversation changes and it starts saying, see, I told you you could do it. See, I told you you could do it all along. <laughs> <laughs> no, the other conversation that's happening in your head is I'll never do this crazy thing again. Never, never, never. And then the next day after a bath and a good sleep, you, um, I wonder what it's like doing it in the other direction from city to city, different hills, different dales, different scenery going the other direction. So it's so interesting how we can talk ourselves into things, out of things, and then perhaps on to the next thing. Mm. Um, and one of the uh, and one of the the topics that we'll address today is uh, personalities, uh, various personalities, and you are our expert in with the use of a personality test that goes back maybe a thousand years or more uh, called the and 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 uh, it's a greek word and my greek i'm not up on my greek other than uh, uh um let me see no greek i can't think of any greek right now uh but oh. it's a a neogram that's correct. Enneagram. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So and it's two and a half th thousand years old, George. There are many Enneagram assessments around the world. The one that I tend to use is a New York assessment from the Enneagram Institute because it has been around the longest and it's validated and it's reliable. So uh, it's a really great assessment from the New York Institute called the Enneagram Institute. And uh, typically with these personality analysis, it says there's different traits that we might be uh, more innate or stronger or where we're at our best. Uh, we, we might be able to venture into other, other skills, but there's something we always return to, our innate, uh, innate skill set, our in, innate uh, go-to when when there's no place else to go. Is that fair? That's correct. That's correct. And actually, that's, that's well put because we just go back to that innate skill. And uh, the research, George, shows that we are born one of these nine personality types. So our brain, we know, is hardwired in the womb. So uh, when we're in our mother's stomach, our brain is already being hardwired. And uh, the set of um, behaviors is peculiar to that personality style. And then nine different Enneagram styles. 
And the interesting research shows that uh, even identical twins, so George, if you had an identical twin brother, you uh, would have different personality styles. Your brains would be hardwired differently in your mother's womb. Um, so it's really interesting because the nature nurture debate is alive and well, but actually from a nature hardwiring, we are hardwired one of these nine personality styles. And to your earlier point, which was a good point, is that, you know, obviously we can use all nine behavior sets, but we are, we'll go back to that innate one that we were born. It's certainly in times of stress. And why is it important for us to understand our, our strongest personality type? Because for personal growth and personal transformation, you need to know your own personality type to say, right, Joni, you know, if your personality type is called the type three in the Enneagram, then, you know, what is the fear of the type three? You know, what is that shadow kind of fear? You and I spoke a few minutes ago about the internal dialogue. And that can be largely driven by the fear and the desires of that personality type and then the attitude of that personality type. So if you know with specificity which one you were born, you can start to self-manage in different ways so that your fears and your blind spots don't trip you up. And you can personally grow and uh, be able to self-manage differently and then communicate uh, in different ways to different personality styles, to other people who are born different personality styles. And and for folks who are wondering, okay, well, what are these personality styles? And, and there's nine of them, which is a little bit of a long list, so I don't expect people to memorize it, but they might be interested. And my guess is if we were to list these pers- these this list of nine, that there's one that will probably jump out for each listener th- that they'll identify with. And, and I know when I, when I glanced through it myself, I said, oh, well, that's me. That's me. <laughs> or, or, or at least I think that's me. And uh, so let's just list those that nine for people so they have an idea of, okay, here's, you could be, you're one of these nine. Yes. And actually, that's a lovely, fun thing to do. And very often I do that is I'll just list the nine and about 80% of people put their hands up and go, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me, which is lovely. So let's start. uh, I'm going to use the, the narrative of the Enneagram Institute in New York. Different Enneagram schools around the world will have different labels for each of the nine, but I particularly like the the New York labels. So the type, I'll start with uh, one that's easy to identify if you were born this type, uh, and that is the type eight. We call them the challenger. So this is a my way or the friggin' highway type person, very self-confident, very decisive, a call a spade a shovel, Uh, can be blunt, can be threatening, um, very decisive and very forward looking. So they trailblazers, they make change in the world. Of course, they can be, you know, tyrannical and, and, uh, you know, steamroll people, but they also can make really good change in the world. And uh, just recently, it's been a Martin Luther King uh, day in in America, and uh, we believe that he was born a type eight. So there's someone who, a challenger who has, you know, made really good change in the world. So that's the type H. Shall I carry on, George? Please do, yes. And and you okay. said type H. Tape. So does each have a separate Sorry. letter? No, I didn't. It's my South African uh, linguistics are not that good. So type H as in the number eight. Oh, number eight. Oh, number eight. Got it. Number eight. Okay. So they're numbers rather than letters. Okay. So the type uh, nine which is the neighbor to the type eight, they are called the peacemaker. So they are more withdrawn, they're quieter, they are really receptive, they are right. If you look at the symbol of the Enneagram, which is a circle with a whole lot of lines in between, they are right at the top of the circle and they are looking at all the elements and how to pull things together. So they're often quiet, They're great observers, they're quite creative, Uh, they dislike conflict. So as much as the challenger can eat conflict for breakfast, the type eight goes, whoa, no, let's avoid that conflict, let's avoid, let's keep the peace, let's keep the peace. So hence they're called the peacemaker. 
The third is uh, the type one that I'm going to describe. And we give them two names. The, the normal name is the, piece, the perfectionist um, because they like detail. They like to dot, dot the I's, cross the T's, spreadsheets, real you know, detail. Um, but they actually, when you tell a type one, look, you know, you've done the assessment, you were born a type one, they detest that word, the perfectionist. They prefer the word, the reformer. So um, here's another great leader example, actually. Type one, we believe Nelson Mandela, our very own uh, president of uh, South Africa, who passed on a few years ago, Nelson Mandela, we brought we think he was born a type one, very principled, very purposeful, very diligent personalities. And now what about the type two, the helper? Those are the people, George, in teams that are always you know, going to the next team uh, member or a new team member to say, how can I help you? Do you need the passcode? Do you need the Wi-Fi code? You know, if you're going to present this at the board, these are the key influences you need to speak to. So they're great communicators and they're great people who reach out to others um, and help and connect. And uh, they really are great people people. They're incredibly observant of, you know, what is the culture in the team um, and what is the happiness factor in this team like? And let's make sure that uh, people are working together well. The uh, number three on the Enneagram is called the Achiever. I was born the Achiever. Um, I have to say that the levels of psychological health for all of these types, when I first uh, found this out 25 years ago, I uh, wasn't exactly happy being born a type three Achiever um, because they can be very driven, very much workaholics and uh, do nothing else but work. And on, on the higher side of the Achiever, is really that, is setting goals, getting stuff done and being very pragmatic. So practically, I love to look at communication and people and teams and you know how we work together. And that's very much a type three's domain. And an achiever, I'm guessing, is thinking, why run a regular marathon when you could run an ultra marathon? Yes, well definitely spotted, an achiever. Well <laughs> spotted, well spotted. Yes, let's go above and beyond. Exactly. Well spotted, George. The number four on the Enneagram is called the individualist. They're also a quieter personality type and they're incredibly creative, very self-expressive. We get a lot of uh, entertainers being this type. So I believe Art Garfunkel um, is this type and you know they'll write good lyrics and they, they are really soulful kind of people. Um, but they could be creative in other ways. It could be in gardening and cooking and photography and anything else, but they do lean towards the creative and they try and stand out from others and hence the name, the individualist. Um, how am I different and in what way am I different? And very good linguists, so very good ability to talk, very good ability to tell stories, um, very, very good linguists. So that's the type four. The type five, and we're nearing the end now, George, the type five is called the investigator. They are also more withdrawn, more introvert, and they are the researchers. They are people that are investigating and innovatively finding new stuff and saying, right, actually, in fact, I, I think uh, Elon Musk, who now lives in America, South African, was born a type five. So, you know, how do we take people to live on Mars? What do we do very differently, you know? And uh, that ability to really maverickly do things vastly, vastly differently because of their uh, mental competence and their ability to research and join the dots, which uh, many of us can't join. So incredibly clever people, the type fives. The type sixes are the most difficult to describe. They're called the loyalist and they can be quite shy and anxious and what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? Their internal dialogues always on, you know, the glass half empty, but they can also be quite out there and, you know, making things happen. So they're a bundle of opposites. They could be quite, uh, you know, nervous and they could be quite strong-minded. Whichever they are, they're incredibly, incredibly intuitive. They can smell, you know, bull dust coming around the corner. And they are loyal. They are loyal to their marriages, to their workplaces, to their friends, to their hobbies, that, that hence they're called the loyalist. 
And then the very last of the Enneagram types, because then we would have done all nine, is the type seven. The type seven is the enthusiast. The type seven is out there, assertive, where are we going? Let's make it happen. It's kind of, um, you know, the Richard Branson of all the types. Um, you know, let's start a business here on airlines and underwear and makeup and music and wherever. Um, so trailblazers, so high energy, high dynamism, love spontaneity, very versatile, and uh, quite a lot of fun to be around the enthusiasts. So there they are, in short, nine very, very different personality styles and different ways of communicating, self-managing, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, really managing their lives in vastly different ways. Mm, yes, sounds uh, very different type of people. Now, I'm curious, there's nine on the list, and I would assume that you would have started with number one, but you started with number eight. Why did you do that? Because actually we can take the nine and we can cluster them into three, let's just for simplicity say three neighborhoods. So the eights, nines, and ones live in what we call the anger neighborhood. Type eights, the challenger will act out their anger. They'll, you'll hear them coming, you'll hear how vociferously cross they are about something. Um, the nines withdraw and they deny their anger. They keep the peace, they're the peacemakers and the type ones control their anger. So I started with the eight to answer your question more explicitly now is because we, we invariably start with the eight and we describe that neighborhood first. Then we describe the second neighborhood, which is the feeling neighborhood. Type twos are the helper, they act out their feelings. Type threes will often deny their feelings because they're on task and they're trying to achieve. And type fours, the individualists will sink into their feelings. So that's the feeling neighborhood or triad. And then the last triad or neighborhood is called the thinking neighborhood. And those very clever investigators like Elon Musk, always thinking, always joining the dots, um, you know, they really kind of sink into their feeling. The type sixes are really denying the fact, did I say feeling? I mean, thinking, type fives thinking. Type sixes in terms of thinking are always kind of a bit of amnesia to their own ability to think and plan and can be indecisive. And then the type uh, sevens are always overthinking and, you know, trying something new and going beyond their thinking. So hence we start with an eight because of these three neighborhoods. Mm. And does that mean that if a person is in one of those neighborhoods, that they are also more likely to have shoulder personality of the other two types? Very good insight there. Not a lot of people ask that question, George, and I've been teaching this for 25 years. So, yep, very, very good question. Is they could have, um, we actually call it wings, but shoulders would work. <laughs> so you're born a head, uh, you know, that's your type. And then on either side, you've got a shoulder connected to the head. So that's always on the circumference of the circle. So if we're talking about a type nine, clearly they could have a, a shoulder of an eight or a shoulder of a one. But similarly, a type one could have a shoulder of a nine or a shoulder of a two. So the shoulders don't have to be in that neighborhood. They can kind of straddle neighborhoods. Mm. And, and, and based on the little conversation we've had so far, Joni, can you tell, can you tell where I am roughly? <laughs> Are you good at that? <laughs> um, well, here's two things, actually. The one thing is we haven't had enough conversation. Um, but most importantly, the second thing, George, is that uh, I signed a Hippocratic Oath in New York 25 years ago that said I'll never tell people their Enneagram type because it robs them of their self-awareness. So what I have done on radio shows and TV shows is people have um, done their assessment beforehand and then I've described the nine types and they've guessed which type they were. And then I've been able to say, yes, you spot on the money here. You're probably born this type because this is your score. So we've done that in fun other ways. But I, I dislike labeling people and boxing people. And when I don't know them, it's uh, that's definitely just putting them in a box. And you're far more than one of those personality types. When you do the assessment, you'll get scores for all the nine types. 
Um, and then the art and the science of it is to find out which of those nine you were born, which would be in your top one or two or three scores, maybe. Now, of the nine types, so when one does an assessment and, and discovers where, you know, your strongest, uh, your, your strongest personality is, does that mean you work to leverage that and build that strength? Or does it mean you might look at some of the other ones where you're weak and shore them up somehow? Mm, another excellent question. It sounds like you're either intuitive, George, or you've done some research because uh, that's exactly what differentiates the Enneagram from Myers-Briggs, Insight, DISC, Finder, the other personality uh, typologies. But this is a system. So to answer your question is that if I'm born a type three, and you look at the circle of the Enneagram, there's a triangle within the circle and there is a hexag. So it actually gives you lines of personal growth and lines of uh, stress. So if you want to be a better version of your type three, it actually shows you in the system that you need to pull some of the behaviors of the type six towards you. So I'm gonna pause there and say something else that links to this is that journey i mean i'm in my mid 50s now i was born a type three i'm hopefully going to die in my mid 90s but i'll still die a type three you're born a personality type you will die the very same type however the more you personally grow and the wiser you become and the more your emotional intelligence develops you will use a number of different behavior sets and the enneagram gives you a path for personal development so the type three will pull the type six. So it actually does give you a way of becoming a better three. You don't become um, just a platinum level three. You've got obviously lots of uh, versatility and agility in your personality to deal with different people, different tasks, different uh, situations, different phases perhaps in a business. So we want to have that uh, personality agility and the Enneagram shows you how to develop that personality agility. Where do, where do the labels of introvert and extrovert fit into this? Actually, they fit in quite snugly. There was a lot of research done by a psychiatrist by the name of Karen Horney. And um, she actually had looked at Freud's work and she decided, and it's really good research, that there's introvert and extrovert Enneagram types. Her labeling was uh, assertive personality types and withdrawn. And then she had a third bucket, which she called compliant or dutiful. So the assertive personality types or the extroverts on the Enneagram are the type eight challenger, the type seven enthusiast and the type three achiever. They're the extroverts or the assertives. And then the introverts are the type nine, the peacemaker, sit in the shadows, watch what's happening, keep the peace. The type four, the investigator, uh, uh, type four, the individualist, sorry, really, you know, understanding emotions. And the type five, investigator, really researching. Those are the withdrawn or introvert types. And then the other three fall in a bucket, as I say, called compliant or dutiful. So they're compliant to different things. They're more difficult to describe. Um, the type ones are very compliant to rules and processes and procedures. They're the perfectionist. The type two are very compliant to other people's needs. What do other people need? They're called the helper. And the type six is very compliant to what they are committed to or loyal to. They're called the loyalist. So that's a good question because actually if you wanting to know about the Enneagram, you could do kind of the 101 simple version. Am I extrovert, introvert, or compliant? And then you would see whether you're in one of those three buckets, and then you could study further or, or research further. These uh, strengths can also be weaknesses. Yep. How do we recognize when our strength is turning into a weakness? For example, I, I look at the at the word loyalist, and I think, well, you know, and, and you mentioned loyal to to their family and, and such, and loyal to their company. But I'm thinking there are times when you're working for the long wrong company and you gotta leave. Yes. <laughs> 
So that's also really good insight, George, because uh, your strengths can always be overplayed um, and your assets become your liabilities. So just building on your loyalist example is a perfect example because you could be loyal to an organization, but you've outgrown that organization 10 years ago, but you're still around and you should have had the chutzpah and the dynamism and the grit to leave and to start somewhere else. So you, you know, and it's simply actually in a marriage, you could have outgrown that marriage and you could be staying in that marriage and it's long gone stale and long not serving both partners. So certainly for each of the types, they can overdo their strengths. The type eight, the challenger, challenging the status quo, trying to find new things, trailblazing, you know, looking at uh, what future trends are. If you are overdoing that and you're just steamrolling, steamrolling people to get ahead, get ahead, get ahead, you, uh, you could really make some... So uh, for all of these nine types, they, they need to be aware of their strengths. And then how do they make sure that they don't overplay those strengths? Do, do these strengths become a haven when we're stressed, stressed or, th or threatened? They certainly, they, um, to your earlier starting point, which was good, you know, you kind of revert back to the type that you were born. So they become a haven because you, you hardwired that way. It's, so it's automatic behavior. And actually, when people are stressed, the FBI uses the Enneagram because they can show when world leaders are stressed. They, they, they pretty much, those habits are automated and you kind of play out an automated set of habits. However, when you are not stressed and you're more mindful and you're more present and you're more self-aware, Socrates said uh, self-awareness is the beginning of wisdom. So when you're more self-aware, you actually then will choose how you respond to people and in what way, you will choose that whole behavior set according to the person you're speaking to, the task, the issue, where the business is and the business growth. So you will not easily, people will not easily know your Enneagram type. And I find those leaders that I deal with are exemplary because they are not stuck in a certain automated pattern. They are free of their Enneagram type. So there's a little bit of an oxymoron here is you need to, for personal growth, know which type you are born. And then you want to kick that box away and you want to go, right, I don't want to be a slave to that Enneagram type. I want to be agile and uh, use different behavior sets according to the situation and the people that I'm working with. When we experience conflict in, let's say, in the workplace, for example, is that likely when we are exploring a, a personality style that's not us? Is, it, is that more likely to be? It could be. It could also be there is a stress point for each of the Enneagram types. So I describe the type three as my growth point is to pull the type six towards me. Um, my stress point in conflict would be uh, the type nine, perhaps, where I'll go to the lower version of my Enneagram type. So it could be two things, if I had to really kind of simplify it. It could be that I'm overdoing my type threeness. So I'm task orientated, I'm goal driven, I'm like, take no prisoners, this will be done by the 28th of January, you know, come the hell or high water. Um, or I could be going to the stress point of the type nine. So in conflict, you could be overdoing your strengths and their liabilities, or you could be very, very stressed and going to the lower end of psychological health of the stress point. Is it helpful when, when working on a team, uh, and, and, I, and I think the answer is yes, and, and this might be a silly question. Uh, is it helpful to, for us to have some idea of the people around us, where their, 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 their strength is, what, where they are at, so that when they do something that offends us, we can, we can sit back and go, oh, that, that's, just their, uh, that's just their achiever talking. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, George. And actually, um, that's really is why we often call the Enneagram the tool of compassion. And if you've got good emotional intelligence, you are not only empathetic towards others, 
um, but you're compassionate towards them and you're compassionate towards yourself. So I can say categorically, my yummiest work, and I do lots of work across resilience and sleep and emotional intelligence and mental resilience, um, but my yummiest work is exactly the scenario you've just painted, is that in a team, if you know the Enneagram types of the team members, not only can you work together um, more constructively and bring out each other's strengths, which is what team members and leaders should do, but in fact, the entire team performance goes from good to great. So it's hugely advantageous to understand and um, yes, I mean, your example is a good example. You know, someone's throwing their toys out the cot and you can go, well, you know, that's the challenger, you know, just kind of strutting their stuff and, and you know, having a, you know, amygdala hijack moment where they're just throwing their toys out and we'll all just take a deep breath. Soon this will pass and uh, we can get on with the conversation at hand without taking it to heart and getting all kind of really upset about them and leaving the meeting and, you know, having that domino effect of, of someone throwing their toys out in the meeting. So you really get to understand others, where they're coming from, more forgiving, more compassionate, and more also a challenger would be okay with you saying, hey, James, that's enough. Like, let's put a stop to that because that's not part of this meeting. We're moving swiftly along. And that might sort of take James out of his kind of, you know, ranting mode into, okay, next meeting, another meeting to discuss that. Let's get on with the, the job at hand. So it's hugely advantageous for how team members communicate with one another. Now, that's interesting. Uh, the, and, and we used the example of the challenger. Uh, but any style, if you attempt to reach them, uh, to persuade them, is it wise to do your best to adopt their style? No, because that'll be inauthentic and they'll smell that inauthenticity. So you won't adopt their style, but what you will know is what are their triggers. So if you're persuading or influencing, which is a key skill we all need, is that how do I influence them? So uh, my late husband was a type five, the investigator and very um, deep thinking man. And if I wanted to go out for supper and go to a movie at night, I, and we worked together, I wouldn't walk into his office and say, hey, Gareth, um, how about a uh, dinner and then a movie tonight? Because he, his brain's in too many pace, places. So if I wanted to uh, influence him to go to a movie and dinner, I would send him an email, believe it or not, and say, hey, Gareth, what about tonight um, we could go to one of these two restaurants, these three movies are playing, which movie would you like to pick? Now I'm playing the achiever because I want a, that end goal. I know what I want. I'm giving him choice. And then he would have time to think about it. And in his own time, the withdrawn, quiet investigator would probably research the three movies. Like, do any of these appeal? Does he want to do that dinner? And then he would do a bit of research before he emailed me back. But I wouldn't have put the spotlight on him and asked for an immediate response because they don't like that. So I haven't adopted his style. I've just given him the fodder, the meat, the, the intel that he needs, the data to make a good decision. So it's knowing their triggers makes it very useful. <laughs> mm. uh, Joni, you, you also do work with resilience. Yes. And, and and does resilience tie into to these nine? And where does it fit? And and are some of these people more resilient than others, or or do they use different methods to uh, to uh, tap the resilience? They definitely use different methods. There's no one type that's more resilient than others. So the work that I do is very often I'll take a team on a journey. The first part of the journey, George, is this is which Enneagram type were you born so that you can be authentic and play to those strengths. And then once I know that with the team, then there'll be other resilience techniques. So there'll be some emotional intelligence techniques I share with them, some mental techniques, critical thinking, but it's all where they can take those techniques and they feel very comfortable adopting them and integrating them into their lifestyles to make them more resilient in their own different ways. So you know, I'm vociferous that it's not a cookie cutter approach. 
when you're trying to enable people to be more resilient. It needs to be very different for different people. Uh, Joni, for those who are interested to learn more about resilience and how they can understand their own resilience and, and even build it, I believe you have uh, uh, a quick assessment that they might tap into. And, I and, do. And, and the best way for them to get a hold of that is how? It's actually to email me, George. So Joni, J-O-N-I, at Resilient People, one word, Resilient People, and then the South African uh, domain is .co.z. Or how do you say it in America? Uh, in, 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 Z in, in the States, Z in Canada. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, Z or Z, Z A. So I'll say it again, Joni, J-O-N-I, at resilientpeople.co.za. And you can find that email in the description below, and and they can get they can get a hold of you, learn more about that resilience test, and um, and perhaps even review it with their team to better understand their team. Joni, in in uh, in wrapping up, if you could offer one, two, or three pieces of advice to team leaders in how they can go about understanding the personalities of their team. What, what would be those one, two, or three pieces of advice? The first thing I would do in a team meeting is I'll put up some flip chart paper and I'll get some post-its and I'll say to my team members, when communicating with me, please do and please don't. And do a round robin. Everybody do that. So if you want to know your team members, so for me as a, an achiever, so I don't like small talk. I like getting down to business and getting points on the scoreboard. And everybody's got their different ways of communicating and different ways of being handled. So as a team leader, if you don't know the Enneagram, do that. Please do and please don't communicate with me in this way. The second thing I would do in terms of team cohesion and, and communication with a team is I would have a look at what kind of boundaries we want. So, you know, what's the earliest we can email? What's the latest we can email? Simple things like that. Please do, please don't on a team boundary setting. And then the third thing I would say, you know, what would make you play to your strengths? You know, what would absolutely, and for me, it's always giving me a brief to say, here's the project, here's the success uh, deliverables, here's the timeline, journey, come back with a project plan. So, you know, for other people, it's, you know, they want to do things in different ways. So more asking, less telling is what uh, leaders should do. Uh, probably the probably the most important piece of advice, uh, less, less telling, more asking. My guest today is Joni Petty, reminding you to be aware of your personality strength, but don't become a slave to it. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.